I'm Safia Smani and this is Full Right Women podcast season two. We're excited to bring to you 20 new brilliant women who are pushing the boundaries in their fields and lives and serving as inspirations to so many around them. Joining us today is Atiya Abbas. Atiya is a feminist who worked with Girls at Tabas, a collective that started conversations on public spaces in Pakistan. Since her return from the University of Missouri, she has been involved with this collective, arranging events across Karachi and Lahore, protesting harassment on the street, and setting up small tea stalls to engage with the public. She also helped to organize the first three Orat marches in Pakistan. Currently, she helps run social media for Karachi Bachal Tehreek, a collective of activists that have highlighted the unlawful demolitions and evictions happening across Karachi. Hi, Atiya. Hello, Sophia. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good, good. Long time. Long time. <laughs> yeah, I know. Long time. That's what I was thinking about it. I was looking at everything that you do. And um, I think the first thing I want to start with, Atiya, is, you know, female friendship that I've seen a lot on your, you know, Instagram, on your social media as well. I see you talk about that as well. So I guess the first thing I want us to start talking about is, you know, the patriarchal conditioning in female friendship and the nuance, subtle nuances there, um, the complexities. When did you first start thinking about it? So I started kind of thinking about this um, topic um, uh, as soon as kind of like my U.S., um, you know, uh, Fulbright program and, you know, coming back to Pakistan. And then it suddenly starts kind of hitting you in really, really subtle, subtle ways that your mobility is so controlled in this, um, in our structure, patriarchal structure that, and, you know, that control of mobility really stops you from um, fostering your friendships, right? Um, And when we are young girls, we are kind of told that, Eventually, we'll have to go to our own homes and, you know, there, so there is like father's home and then there is the, you know, the married home and in between, you're kind of just like chilling and, you know, in limbo, but you never really are encouraged because your mobility is controlled to foster your female friendships, your friendships, like your all those, those girls in school um, that you got along with and that you, you know, thought that you guys, and you know, we, all those cards that you gave each other, all, the, all those promises, and they all seem to kind of like um, fade away when um, marriage comes in the way, when all of, uh, when all we are aspired to be is wife, mother, daughter, all of those roles, and not exactly like, um, you know, if we get a scholarship to go abroad, that's hardly celebrated because it's like, when you come back, um, we'll talk about your marriage. So once I got back into here, I also noticed that there was very little uh, encouragement to build a community. And by community, I don't mean like your family or one people that you're connected to by work or or some kind. There, you know, there is uh, something. Uh, so there was no way to make those communities on your own because we are not encouraged in our culture to set up in such a way that it's extremely limited. So you move from your school to, to you know, university to uh, workplace, if you get to work and then family. So, you know, your circles are limited like in that way, but where is the room for like friendship outside of these things where you are not linked to people by way of networking, by way of like, you know, survival in the, in, you know, to make money. So, you know, because female friendship is one of those things that is considered extremely frivolous. Like um, today you have your friends, tomorrow, you know, there will be other people is something I get told a lot. And I'm like, yeah, but okay, so people will move on. And, but the, the, the friendship that we had is something that I cherish, is something that matters to me. So, you know, like that kind of like patriarchal in the sense conditioning or even the way the structures are set up in our society to limit our mobility so that we cannot really deepen our friendships. So that's where kind of I started thinking about it. Just within what you've just talked about, there's so much to unpack here. Um, I'm going to take a step back. Let's talk about internalized misogyny first, right? Yeah. Because I'm sure you, um, I'm guessing you might have also come across, you know, a lot of, I'm going to talk about women here because we're talking about women friendship, right? Um, a lot of women, French women who go like, oh, I think guys are better friends. 
I don't think <laughs> girls can be good friends, right? I hear, I've heard that so many times from girls, from women around yes. me. And I'm like, where is this coming from, this internalized misogyny? Did you come across that? So I, um, for, so I, I had to unlearn it myself. And it's something I'm still working on. Um, I feel that I had this conversation yesterday only um, from this recording, is that something is uh, the internalized misogyny is also how we treat our female friendships. We are so hard on them. Even within us, we would be like, she didn't meet me or she didn't call me or she didn't text me back. I'm going to, and I'm going to just cut myself off. You know, like we do these, we do these um, very like unnecessarily, um, you know, like difficult things to our female friends, then they don't deserve it. It's, uh, there was something I saw on Instagram that why are we so hard on our female friends? Why do we expect so much um, out of, like, of course, expectations in a relationship are there, but we kind of expect for them to be like, are there forever, even though we now we know that through, uh, if some, if your say your female friend is married, she has a whole host of other problems in her life. And if she did not reply or text back, we don't have to be so hard on her. So this kind of like is something I have come across a lot. And even when I was younger, I used to say that guys are like less drama or whatever. But <laughs> Um, I think that part of that is a concept that I, I've kind of unlearned it. Um, I come across a concept called patriarchal bargaining. We bargain with the patriarchy in order to get our freedoms. So when we do that, we kind of view women as competition, right? Because it's like, oh, if she gets um, the, this CEO position or if she gets this promotion, then there will be less for me. So we, we view it in that scarcity mindset. And that kind of, um, you know, uh, deepens our internalized misogyny. So I think that unlearning it was also part of like how I am, uh, how I fostered my kind of like my tribe of like, you know, girls, because I, I love them very much. And I feel that my unlearning was in the fact that I work hard in the sense, if someone says I can't hang out, I'll say, okay, we'll reschedule. And, you know, those are the kind of like, those are the kinds of um, room that we make for each other. And that is what has helped in like, you know, just sustaining these friendships. We are in more than one ways, uh, you know, probably a lot of ways that we haven't probably even discovered yet. Um, burdened by the legacy of uh, patriarchy, misogyny, yeah. right? All of that. And we keep discovering new ways that are kind of embedded in us, even whatever we call ourselves evolved you know self-actualized whatever we may want to call ourselves but till date you know we all are discovering all those things um one of those things for women is you know you mentioned marriage right so and one of the things that you said was that you know how we kind of are very tough and very hard on our female friendships is perhaps the result of the same mind frame same set of thoughts that have been given to us that, oh, female friendships are not so important. While you're in school, sure, go ahead, right? While you're studying, sure, go ahead. If you're going to work and there is another, you know, woman there happening to be around you, sure, go ahead. Once you get married, your husband's friends are your friends. We have seen this so much in our society, so much, right? Yes. Where, where the husband, the men, their friendships, you know, stay uh, for longer periods in life, right? And the women, their wives, are expected to just, you know, tag along in those friendships, leave theirs behind, right? And they're okay. A lot of women are okay with that. They might be sad, yes, but they won't show. They take pride in, oh, my husband's friends are my friends, right? Oh, my friend, I don't know. She's just moved somewhere, whatever. She's busy with her own family. Family first. This family first thing carries so much burden and it is part of the internalized misogyny as well right where women also take pride in that did you uh, come across such um challenges in the friendships you were trying to create uh okay so i would say like uh that definitely is um you know obviously because we are taught uh, we are taught to, you know, kind of locate our uh, validation, our kind of self-worth in another being and that person being marriage or, or that uh, set of circumstances being marriage. And so therefore it is completely natural that we would, because of the conditioning, we would kind of like set aside and, you know, um, our friendships. And this is, um, it's a lot of like, uh, I had to, uh, these challenges and I feel that the, if I have understood it, like say if my awakening or, um, you know, 
maybe I understand um, those friendships better. And of course, I'm going, uh, everyone's going to laugh at me, but I'm going to plug my favorite author again, Elena Ferrante, who wrote uh, these four novels about female friendship. And they are across 60 years. They follow two girls, Lila and Elena, from the ages of six to 60. So they're, uh, and they're phenomenal. Like, okay, so, and, th- and this is where I'm going to come at you. That whole friendship is extremely messy. So Lila and Elena don't love each other and they are cruel to each other and in the ways that we have been probably cruel to our female friends and all. So that is where I kind of located, uh, you know, and understood that people are, people in fact, like, no, we we allow the men in our lives a complexity, a nuance, and they're like, oh, achha, just come mood off it. We don't allow that to our, sometimes we don't allow that to our female friends. We don't allow them that complexity or that nuance. And so we, and we should. Um, that is what is, you know, kind of like, that is what is going to kind of build healthy relationships. So, so of, you know, there will be so many people listening to you. Hopefully people listen to this podcast. Uh, yeah, fingers <laughs> crossed. What would be like, you know, I don't want to say, oh, give us three tips, five tips, whatever. I don't want to number it. But what are some of the ways that you can, you know, advise women to work towards their female friendships? I think I go around like telling Part of it is like, you know, awareness building is from your social media. It's how you live your own life and how you kind of incorporate those things in your own way. And I kind of do it by like being extremely like, I'm a, I'm planning a woman-only beach trip. I'm a, I'm doing a girls-only picnic. And so come to the park and come to hang. And it's all like, you know, I, I mean, I feel that I, I when I do these things and people come through, they realize that, you know, this was actually really nice. And I kind of, I'm very, I guess I'm very um, clear that, listen, like, I know you love your, we all love our husbands and our fiancés and our boyfriends, but today they are not the center of your universe. Um, we are going to like, you know, and and so, and that really, 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 um, you know, that really, like, it's such a great space. It, and it has helped me, uh, at least, um, at least um, being, choosing to remain single and making all these decisions in my life uh you know it's not easy in Pakistan it's a bad it's kind of like you you've chosen this path right so if you choose so if I prioritize my female friendships it's kind of given me more like faith and connection and 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 more deepening of my kind of like uh, you know, community building in society and that is where I find more strength and so I feel that if people want to kind of work on these I think some of the things I said that like, don't be diff- hard on them allow them this allow your friends this complexity this nuance and try to do things together that you enjoy doing together those are some ways that I've kind of gone about it that's beautiful uh, with that I want to kind of move on to you know one of the things that you said earlier in this conversation you mentioned mobility right with mobility we are also talking about the the moment someone says mobility, I'll start thinking public spaces as well for women, right? And yeah. then I start thinking about something that I personally am very deeply passionate about is, you know, reclaiming public spaces, especially in developing countries. And we are going to stick to our country, Pakistan, right? Um, there's some another initiative of yours that you have been participating in and, you know, been active in, which is Girls at Tabas. How did yeah. that idea come, you know, come across? So uh, again, like this is all credit to my all the amazing, you know, women and femmes that I have known in my life. And it's um, Sadia and Fiza and Natasha and kind of how they, they were started this conversation in 2015 and on Facebook. And that was the year I was like coming back to Pakistan. And I started following it while I was still in Mizzou. Um, so then I was like, oh, this is so exciting. And, you know, uh, the first, the first thing is when it hits you that there are less women in public spaces. And so why is that? Uh, it's not that like, it's not that anyone says that you can't sit at a dhaba. It's um, kind of how our own internalized that, oh, we can't be here. It's because we are in condition that way, right? Um, the women stay in the private and the men stay in the public. So that kind of like, you know, and just like breaking that um, boundary or that barrier was the thing that, you know, uh, I, I was very fascinated by. So, you know, um, coming back and, you know, over, and then you realize because even in the U.S., you've been, you've walked a lot of cities, you've, you've discovered cities by walking and taking public transit. And that kind of, when you come back, you're like, oh, okay. So 
there are ways to reimagine our spaces and reimagining also means an act of rebel so that kind of is like going and reclaiming public spaces so uh, part of that um, so that collective alone taught me a lot in the sense of pushing my boundaries and th- th- you see that's where it all begins our there's something amna chaudhry wrote in her um, newsletter which you should really read it's on friendship and she says our resistances are rooted in friendship it's our friends that encourage us to kind of like you know uh you know break the break the norm be be um like resist uh our you know resist our family norms and things like that so that's where our fears I kind of, so yeah you know, conquer our fears and things like that so it's kind of coming all full circle for me because uh, from what that breaking barrier to realizing that those friendships are what pushed me to resistance right so that is where i feel that um that collective um you know and we, the conversation kind of went on for 3 years we would document girls drinking chai and then you know, posting it on social media and that was also kind of like a, uh, an internet archiving project in its own and then uh, from there kind of like organizing orat march and all of that it 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 was a natural like pro- progression into this girls at tabas what is your like first memory of actually going and you know sitting with the collective at a dhaba what was that like walk me through it i think it was bhadrabad um, or alamgir road um, that's where like this quite alamgir thing is and it's like oh okay um, you know it's the, the first thing that hits you is is that how less space there is actually there's a footpath and people have to walk on it there are motorcycles on it there are um you know you but, but you have to uh, oh and then of course that whole aspect of this is why the dhaba is so great it's it's a free flowing space because now we have these like gentrified spaces which are like our family section mein baith jaye and again that concept of family right um uh, busy like if if it's women it's a family so you know like uh, but uh, the, the 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 informal dhaba the one that has cropped up in the hole in a hole in the wall that is a space that is truly connecting with the public so the 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 first of that was like you know the that's where you know when you realize that there's like a puddle of water and you have to like step across it and now you have to sit down and you feel that of course you are as open like to the elements and and all of that but it is so nice to be uh, you are um, as in you are with people but you're also like kind of engaging with the city for in a way that we we are not encouraged to so that is very very uplifting what was the kind of reception that you got um it was like oh, so it's all like sort of you know um a lot of people were very encouraging i think there are people who still message us to this day that there you know facebook inbox messages that oh um can we like you know what happened and all but like i think it was a natural kind of like um the collective members doing moving on but the reception has been kind of Uh, you know very very encouraging but also uh, sort of like you know this does not happen over here and who is actually you know like it's so interesting how people say things like who is stopping you from going out anyway and then you're like have you even lived as a desi woman in this country so you know it's like that th- those are the reactions that really make you laugh because you're like and you know like we did a cycle rally and we we go with bicycles and 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 uh, all of that and that was something like you, you know like those are some of those pictures like, like people would be like please take them down because the trolling was so bad um and you realize that the internet as much as like we want it to be that democratic space it's kind of like it's it's, it's brutal scary. yeah yeah it's, it's brutal. brutal yeah mm-hmm. uh, i remember the first time i started noticing you know that why are the more women on this you know street there's just mm-hmm. men you know those family parks would just be filled with men right with men. the uh, women areas in the buses would be full of men when you when you uh, you know muster enough strength to actually go out on the street to just walk up to you know the bakery nearby to get whatever you notice how you are in the minority you know even if you don't want to notice it you will be made to notice yeah. that you're in the minority and personally what i found myself doing in the very initial years and you know perhaps uh, perhaps i do that often even now uh, is you know you kind of bring forward your masculine uh, traits more like you still start walking a certain way <laughs> you know to give all these like 
un, you know, these kind of messages to people, don't, don't really just mess with me, you know, I'm on the street, yeah, whatever, yeah. right? You are guarded kind of thing. And I found myself thinking, I wish to see that day when me walking on the street is not an exception. It's not an act of bravery. It's just like a norm, like, you know, and I wish to see that day. Uh, do you have any such memories when you're walking on the streets? You know, when you found yourself walking on the streets, you would find your behavior change shift a little? In terms of like, uh, I would say this, it's been a while, right? Since I've kind of started doing a lot of like pushing my boundaries and all. But I, I can I can say this, it scares me to this day. Uh, I, I walked from my workplace to my friends who actually literally is within walking distance. But you know, it's also like, so you know that the walk is only like 15 minutes, but it's like 15 minutes of so much planning and kind of like working it in your head. And then, okay, you can you can be the most like I've overcome it all person, but it still scares you because it's like if, um, you know, so it was very recent like I, that, that, but I was so excited. I'm so happy I walked because it was really nice it was I know it was hard but like I plugged in my music and I started walking and it was so because we don't kind of like get to um walk you know in our places because we'd be like okay um from one footpath to another you know that kind of thing so um I would say that 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 memory of it was like you know when once you start doing it often it becomes more muscle memory so if I were to do it again I would say yes I would do it because I the the joy and the reward of it is so much greater than the fear because really you have to um so yeah those, those uh you know i i really do wish it were as you said normalized it wasn't like an act of bravery um but uh it, and it you know the more you do it it will stop it will start becoming more normal that's true that's true that's like anything that you know more you do you're gonna get more you know comfortable just doing it more and more um Having said that, okay, now I think we can talk about Aurat March. Yeah. How, how did that? How did that come into being? So you know, like uh, um, part part of like uh, our history of feminist resistance has it's always been there um, from the partition to now, and I think that that's sort of like now is a natural natural progression of what we are facing um, uh, with from. What what the internet has kind of done is like, you know, as I have said, even before, like going back to earlier question about the female friendships is that if we are not encouraged to meet physically, we will talk to each other online, right? So online spaces become that kind of public space, um, virtually, where you kind of get to be, meet people in, with different ideas and on all of that. And so with that comes this natural progression of like, uh, women's resistance and women have been resisting in, in various ways and another iteration of it would be the moving to online and resisting there so that uh, was kind of um uh, with with Aurat March it was like a you know all these feminists kind of coming together and deciding that if there was a women's march uh, across the world then why don't we have our own version of it like how we have to have like a Pakistani uh, Desi South Asian kind of you know call to action and that's how it kind of came about in 2018 we were able to put it together and um the funny thing is a lot of people uh, believe that it's like this um corporate or not just corporate but like a, a group of people are sort of like this um high organized hierarchical structure and you know there's like uh, you know there everyone has a position or something but it's really not that it's just a bunch of people coming together and like, Achha, okay, you take on this responsibility, you do this. It's very, it's one of those things. So it's been, what, it's been three years that, you know, the Earth March has been happening, right? Um, well, we, four. this year was the fifth one. Fifth one. Okay. So over these five years, you know, we live, we learn, we make mistakes, and then we learn from them. What are some of the things that, you know, uh, you think that you personally have, you know, what are some of the takeaways, let's just say that, you know, that you've learned, oh, the first year we did these things, let's just tweak them a little bit more to so that, you know, things like that. Okay, so I think that some of the takeaways have been uh, things like, uh, you know, you know, it's like in a country which is uh, very, uh, if it, which still has its roots are very 
like its rules are so basic in the understanding of women's empowerment and and all of that it's okay to you know it's not the the change is not going to happen like so rapidly in 5 years what has happened and uh, those some of those takeaways have been that reporting in the media of harassment and all has increased more people are talking people have seen social media as the space in the the space where the where the law fails them social media is a space where they say that oh i was such and such a thing happened they put up videos of someone following them and that is like a kind of a public um you know hearing a public calling and i think that is uh, something that has been encouraged by women coming out more by being in public see, um in public spaces so and, and uh, other takeaways have been like um maybe definitely you know streamline your communication and you know uh, be more um accessible to people and we like you know just uh, talk about like the goals and the objectives more in a more like accessible kind of way because like right now you and i are having this conversation and i have used terms like patriarchal bargaining and all of that but that is something that you and i have access to so how can we make it easier for people how can we make them make them like how can we make them more digestible So those have been some of those learnings. That is something really interesting that you said because I remember the first couple of years. You know how this whole, um, the whole halabalu that happened around slogans and you know um, oh. all that. Yeah, yeah. So all of that that happened. Remember, uh, and I realized one thing, Atiya. And obviously, I'm not going to generalize and say it was the case with everyone, but a lot of men. a guy friends of mine would you know um come up to me and go like but what about this you know slogan right mm-hmm. and then i would sit down and explain it to them um and by the end of that conversation they'd be like oh yeah now that you put it this way i get it right so sometimes i felt like it was a matter of communication as opposed to you know a matter of uh the you know ideas right because then they would be like oh yeah i get the idea and then it so i feel like the communication bit that you talked about sometimes to bring people to the same level what we are trying to say because again the burden of i guess patriarchy i guess this also uh-huh. right yeah so the responsibility kind of then comes down to us to kind of explain more um how has that changed the social media kind of strategy around you know or at march do you see any change uh in that aspect to help people understand better you know the things that are that you're trying to bring forward um you know like okay so to i i get where you're coming from like you know just um i have and we've heard this criticism a lot that um oh well if you just explain it nicely but see that is not the point the point of a poster is to immediately like hit your demand right you know it's it's supposed to be it's it is a political it's a political statement it's um supposed to be short and snappy and and if you want a long detailed um explanation you there's always lots and lots of you know what i also feel it's very interesting is that um men in our society uh, they are pretty um, nitpicky about or they'll just cherry pick what they want to understand and not actually like engage or listen so i think that that is uh, something that we have faced and i feel that okay uh, you don't want to listen um, but we have to listen to all of your like you know um, so so be it i mean you don't want to educate yourself that's fine that, that makes sense i mean those who want to understand should engage in a conversation then that's what you're saying right you want to understand more come to us yeah if you know but if it's like if you also don't want to um if you want to sit down like you said na if you if you sat with your friends those men were willing to listen but there are many who are not um they'll just there and this happens a lot um many journalists have tried to um from a lot of i have tried to you know intimidate a lot of organizers and i think that that is also like um, part of uh, the that is part of the them showing their power um and that oh we can you know we can always exercise our our masculinity on you um and not uh, so so it's just something that and you know that kind of further uh, drives our point more um and so that has kind of in the social media space it's changed a lot of mindset if people see videos of journalists or whoever harassing women who are at the march people will say oh then there is a need even more need for our march you see it, it results in the opposite thing and i think that that's i was it's almost like you guys are doing the work for us that makes sense where do you stand with the orth march uh you know 
community, community organizing, you know, team, where do you stand now? Are you still part of it, an active part of it? I, I haven't been organizing for two years, but I think the best part of it has been seeing other, I think a movement should always grow and as, as a female friendship always grows. Uh, and there is new, I think a movement should always have space for new people, for new ideas, for, for um, a, a kind of like, a new way of thinking about things because I think I've learned way more. I think I've learned a lot from young people younger than me. Um, and so I never ever want to uh, feel that something is something can be fossilized in that way. A movement should just keep flowing. But that's why it's a movement. So mm-hmm. I have not organized for two years, but I do feel that um, with more people coming in, it, there's always a space for like, you know, new, new, um, there's always space for more. That's true. That's true. So what's keeping you busy now? Uh, okay, so what's keeping me busy? Uh, what uh, I've been busy with, like I run social media and communications for a lot of other places, but um, in the end, I realized a lot of things come back to uh, my my love for raising um, conversations on gender and public spaces. So I did, um, I covered social media for this collective called Halo Cricket and it was girls playing cricket and it was amazing those girls had the best friendships between themselves and I was just like I, I, the space was so nice um I really enjoyed that so yeah oh well, that's great and there's one more thing that I I read somewhere you also um uh, you also managing the social media for Karachi Bachao Therapy so if you could you know talk a bit about okay yeah uh, you know the relationship of destruction and development you know, I was thinking about that, and I was like, maybe that's a perf- you're the perfect person to talk about it. Um, all right. So, Karachi Pijat Enrique is a collective that kind of took on these um, demolitions and unlawful demolitions and evictions that were happening across uh, across Karachi and even Islamabad and etc. Um, so, part of our uh, you know ideas of engaging with the city are what kind of city, right? Uh, what do we want that shiny neoliberal facade uh de- we do, what do we call development um that everywhere there is like a building and there is a, there is like uh, some you know an american like what, mcdonald's or a starbucks is that what we call development or do we call development the where everyone feels comfortable to step out to to move through the city i was um attending a talk yesterday with that had Gulrez Khan, who was another Fulbright scholar. Mm-hmm. He's talked about that one of our, one of the most important things about a city is how do people move through it? And so is development, who is development done for? Um, the city is like, you know, 1% elite or is it for everybody? And we see in Karachi that that disparity is so massive um, for the for the working class, for the lower income it is so difficult for transport. There is no mass transit. The answer every time comes back to public spaces and developing those. So that is kind of what the collective was challenging and, and saying that these um, developing a city should not come at the cost of the working class and it should not be at the cost of evicting them from their homes. So what you what you're one of the things that you're getting at is gentrification, right? Um, yes. and yeah, and how it has affected not just in Karachi, but like all over the world, it happens all over the world. What yeah. are, um, what are like some of the ways Karachi Bachao Tehreek is, you know, um, raising its voice against uh, gentrification? Like what are some of the methodologies that they're using? So, uh, some of those things have been, um, just advocacy work and a lot of it has been like using the language of the law kind of to talk about, that about what our constitution promises us. Um, our constitution promises us safe housing. Our constitution promises us that no one uh, should, even if, uh, well, the argument goes that encroachments are illegal. Uh, first of all, this is a false argument, but the fact that if you are saying that if someone is le- living here illegally, they have a right to shelter. A citizen of any city has a right to shelter. So then why would, you know, after you legalize their, their um, their abode, their living situation, You there's water, there's a water bill coming, there's an electricity bill coming, then why are you saying that this is illegal? You have regularized it, right? 
So the, by you, I mean the, the municipal corporations and, and all of the city's um, kind of uh, infrastructural authorities, right? So um, then, so from there, we've kind of like used that kind of language to advocate and, and push forward. And even some of it, the protests and going um, out protesting outside the Supreme Court where a lot of these, um, un the, these unfair decisions have been taken. So those have been like ways that we have, and, and of course the other one has been social media advocacy in the sense that many of the people uh, whose house homes were demolished, they kind of uh, got their own, they made their own social media accounts and they started talking about things. And I think that's where a lot of people got attention in the sense that, oh, okay, here's someone who's actually, you know, cause we kind of don't, um, for us, the working class or the lower income and all, we don't, uh, we, we see even our activism in a certain kind of way that it has to look um, very aesthetically pleasing and all that, but that's where our biases and our classism comes in. But if the, a person who has been impacted talking about their their um, struggle and their pain themselves, that's when I think we should be listening. That is true. That is true. In terms of you taking care of the social media, what are some of the strategies that you use to you know build engagement and get the advocacy you know going? Okay, so it's, I won't say it's just me, it's a whole team effort. And um, it's been, um, so the team kind of works together on uh, coming up with, uh, with hashtags that are going to be the slogans. So, so that sort of think of that as like a poster. And we um, then rally uh, everybody around and then we make a, a, a document in which we're like, this is how we're going to be tweeting. And this is how um, my friend, um, so she she was organizing with me, Eamon wrote a fantastic article on how we go about this. So, you know, once this podcast is up, we can link it. But uh, the the some of the strategies have always been like, uh, a lot videos always help um you know collating a lot of data um, but also again at the same time as i said you know making it accessible um we we did this find, uh, this was someone this was a uh, uh, our organizer fiza ganji's idea she said instead of like you know when the spotify wrapped thing became really popular um we used that um she suggested to use that format to talk about how many homes had been demolished and it was our more it was such a popular uh, way of sharing things that people were like this is a, people were like wow okay this idea first of all the idea is great but the ex and the execution and then the content of it um everyone could remember those uh, everyone saw those numbers because you know spotify did that, that you know you, you have to share here. it with me yeah you have to share okay, that okay, with me. <laughs> yeah, i would love to i would love to have a look at that yeah um so Adia, okay so we have talked about so many things. We've talked about female friendship. We have talked about advocacy. We have also talked about, you know, gentrification. We have talked about um, public spaces, reclaiming public spaces, you know, so many things. Um, oh. Looking at all of that, all of the things that you've been doing, how do you see, I, I really hate this question. I really hate that I'm asking this question. It is such a difficult interview question. Like your next <laughs> five years, how do you see yourself five years down the line? So I'm going to try my best to word it differently. Where do you see yourself going from here? Once you realize how like deeply rooted you are in, in, in changing and not changing. And I don't want to be that kind of like, oh, I'm changing the world here. But um, I think, you know, what happens more is that you become more internal and you realize that your fights are always not fights, but more like your uh, struggles are always going to be. Uh, you, you may think that you are, uh, you know, uh, doing something on the collective, but really the change is within yourself. And a lot of it has been, a lot of things have been re, re um, like, you know, coming to terms with my own um, actions or how I've been with people and, and all of that. So I think that from going forward, um, it's always going to be uh, my, my question to myself or before doing anything is that is, will the community be impacted? What is this decision of mine is, is this decision of mine being taken in like selfishness or is this communal and and always towards community building um, rather than, you know, um, individual um, kind of, you know, individualization of yourself. And I think that that is something that's been uh, what I think about because I feel materially or economically, politically, whatever the situation might be, we will always need each other. Yeah. So in a nutshell, you want to be selfless towards your community. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. 
great great all the best with that Atya I had such a good time talking to you today and I hope yeah. the next time we talk is not like two years down the line and I hope we stay in touch <laughs> no, no not at all <laughs> thank you so much <laughs>